Um, I am Nancy Coffey. I help lead the Chairman's Circle at the Greater Memphis Chamber, and I am so glad that you are with us for this first installment of the Chamber's four-part four series about how to create workforce culture. This series is really going to introduce you to thought leadership from across sectors, representing businesses large and small. Um, and as with all Chamber webinars, it's questions from all of you that helps ensure that the information we're delivering is relevant and actionable. So please type your questions into the Q&A field on your Zoom screen. We'll keep an inventory of those questions um, during the presentation. And after we hear from our featured speaker, we've asked Austin Baker, president of HRO Partners, to moderate the Q&A. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our featured speaker, John Daniel. For the last 14 years, John has been EVP and Chief HR Officer at First Horizon. Uh, he is still consulting for First Horizon, but I just recently learned he's going to officially retire at the end of the year. So uh, big news, but the great part about that is he promises to remain in Memphis. So um, for any of you who have had the privilege of connecting with John, you know how crucial that is for our community's progress. John has over 35 years experience in human resources management and leadership. He speaks frequently on culture, change, human behavior, and leadership to audiences really all over the country. So we're, we're very grateful that he's with us today. John has this unique ability to translate research, reading, and his own insight and observation into accessible strategies. It's, it's really an incredible gift. I've, I've never seen an executive um, even come close to, to his brilliance in this arena. He has been a mentor to me for well over a decade and is so generous with his time. He serves on numerous community boards, maybe even as many as five. So John, we are very grateful to you for being with us today. Thank you and take it away. All right, well, thank you, Nancy, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, yes, uh, 45 years in banking is enough and I'm ready to take what I've learned and apply it to this wonderful community, my adopted home that I've come to love. So. Culture by design, culture by accident. What, what, a, what a provocative title. And, uh, you know, it leads to the question, can you actually design culture? And uh, that, that'll be the goal of uh, my comments today is the answer to that question in my mind is absolutely yes. You know, the, uh, the great uh, theorist on culture is a, is a gentleman named Edgar Schein who wrote uh, Organizational Culture and Leadership, which is uh, really the Bible of culture and leadership uh, in, 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 uh, in my profession. And uh, it's been reprinted multiple times, but Edgar Schein once said, the only thing of real importance that leaders do is create and manage culture. If you do not manage culture, it manages you, and you may not even be aware of the extent to which that is happening. And that latter point is a key one that I'm gonna delve into as we talk about this idea of culture. So. You know, the first question is, uh, you know, what is culture? David Foster Wallace, the author who commented on, you know, general culture, uh, once tells the story, told the story of uh, two fish swimming in the water. Uh, two older fish are swimming, two older fish are swimming one way, and in the op opposite direction are two younger fish. And as they pass in the water, the uh, older fish says to the younger fish, How's the water? As they pass a little bit, uh, the, two, the one young fish turns to the other and says, what's water? Well, that's kind of how you think about culture. You know, it's ubiquitous, it's all around us. And in conversations about business or nonprofit organizations or churches, we talk about our culture and we tout our culture and we describe good and bad cultures and we read or uh, papers in business journals about companies that, that, that are having problems because they have flawed or unethical cultures, but what is it? Well, let's get into some definitions, but as we do that, I'll, I'll make a couple of key points, the assumptions on which I operate on as a leader of culture. And one of those culture is important and it, makes a, it can make a difference. There's a ton of research in the business world about how you can make a linkage between culture and that good culture, and we may describe good culture in a little bit, uh, can lead to actually positive financial returns. The second fundamental assumption about culture that I believe in is it can be defined in a way that's meaningful, and you'll hear that in a minute. The other thing is it can be changed for the improvement of the organization. 
Um, you have to be intentional about that to the point of Edgar Schein's opening comments. If you do not manage culture in an intentional way, in other ways it will manage you. And the last thing, the most important for those of you on the phone, as the critical var variable is leadership, uh, particularly the key leader of the, of the organization, the person at the top. Because uh, if you thought your job was about strategy and planning and organizing and all those other management mantras, uh, believe me, it's managing culture. I think it was Peter Drucker who once said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And he was trying to make the point about how powerful culture is. Well, let's dig into that definition. What is culture? Okay. So I'll go back to Shine again, one of my thought leaders. Uh, this will be a little bit academic, but just stick with me and I'll break it down for you. Culture is a pattern of shared basic assumptions, assumptions that a group learned as it solved its problems of external adaptation and internal integration. It works, is valued, and is taught. Wow, that's a mouthful, John. What, what does that mean? Well, let's go to this notion of external adaptation and internal integration. What does that mean? Well, every organization, whether you're starting a church, a nonprofit, or a company, you have some basic questions, right? Who are customers? Who are the people we're trying to impact? Who are competitors? How do we get funding? Who, who, who are investors? Or, or who are the people that are going to donate money? And what's our mission and purpose, right? And when you come up with the answers to those questions, you have a set of beliefs, fundamental beliefs that you hold, whether it's you as an individual or a group of people that come together. They have a set of beliefs. And those beliefs then create culture. Again, we'll dig into this a little more. Just hang with me. The second term is this notion of internal integration. Okay, once we know who our customers are, who the people we're serving, and uh, what we're going to serve them, and who our competitors are, and how we get funding, funding, we have to ask the second set of questions, internal integration, is how do we organize? How do we structure things? Who reports to who, and who makes decisions, and who's in charge? Who has decision rights? Those are really important questions. And when you answer those questions, you do it based on a set of beliefs that operate deep within you that sometimes you're not even aware of. And when we get the culture, you'll find as I work through my comments, that is the key to understanding and changing culture. Uh, you know, you often hear people talk about culture uh, in a kind of a more si simple way, not a bad way, but more simple, like culture is the way we do things around here. Or, you know, it's what it's like to feel to work here. But one tangible way, I like to think about culture, is to think about it this way. I want you to imagine an organization with 5,000 people. And let's just say, just for ease of math, that each of those people conduct 20 conversations during the course of their day. Conversations where they collaborate with someone, they seek information, they work together to serve a customer or a client, uh, or they resolve a conflict together, right? And let's just say you take those 5,000 people and you add that and you multiply by 20 conversations. That means you've got 100,000 conversations happening in your organization every day. Wow, 100,000 conversations. Culture, if you could sum it up. Let's say you had the technology that you had this massive computer that would have, you know, video and audio tapes and you could record all those conversations and then the computer did an analysis of, by the way, the technology does exist today to do this. I think for privacy reasons, we'd never do it. Think of it conceptually as a thought experiment. But what would be the measure of positive emotions and negative emotions that exist in those 100,000 conversations, right? If the majority of the emotions that are registered are negative, then obviously you wouldn't have a positive culture. In fact, I've known myself when I joined a new company that I, I visit the, the mail room and the break room and you know, and go to uh, celebrations and meetings and listen in. And I can tell very quickly whether you have a healthy or unhealthy culture. You just listen to the quality of the conversations. And so that's a very tangible way in which you think about culture. And for me as an HR executive, think about it. How do I impact culture? Well, I got to think about it as impacting the quality of those 100,000 conversations. You know, as a head of HR, I do that in multiple ways, right? I do that with my team. We coach people when they're being less effective. We teach people how to be self-aware through sessions where well, the most important thing we teach them is self-awareness of this idea is I understand how the things I say and do impact others. 
and that if I'm going to be successful in my work, I have to adjust my behavior so that I do that more effectively, right? It's, it's leadership training to make sure that leaders learn to manage more effectively. It's, it's conflict management sessions. So there are a hundred little interventions, big and small, I shouldn't say little, hundred interventions, small and large, that we, we engage in to change the quality of those 100,000 conversations. And if you think about culture, that's the way you take this, this construct. You know, culture is a construct in the sense that we know it exists, but it's not really tangible. But if we think about it in terms of 100,000 conversations a day, or do your own math in your own organization, you can make it tangible. You know, Yuval Harari in his wonderful book, Sapiens, said this about, uh, about, about humans. He said, we came to dominate the world because we can cooperate flexibly in large numbers. This arises from our unique capacity to believe in things that exist primarily in our imagination. You know, homo sapiens is actually from the Latin word meaning wise man, right? And I remember growing up in my high school and college classes, I learned, I'm a baby boomer, right? It's a, I, I learned that the reason why homo sapiens came to dominate the planet, keep in mind there were multiple hom homo species, human species uh, coexisting uh, along each other uh, early in our existence, um, is that because we were wise. You know, our, rash, our power of rational thinking, that, that was what uh, helped Homo sapiens come to dominate the planet. We now believe, in fact, that's not the case. We certainly have benefited from our power of rational thinking. But it is actually our deep wiring, our deep wiring, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, to actually collaborate and cooperate with others. We have this deep need to do that. And the fact that we can think in terms of abstractions like bureaucracy and government and culture, which is one of the softest of all, is what allows us to dominate the planet and do the things we've done. But we've got to have tools, we've got to have labels, framing, if you call it, to help us manage that in a tangible way. Um, and that's what leaders need. So how do I do that? I'm gonna dig in just a little bit more before I transition to this notion of what is culture. Uh, I go back to Edgar Schein again. Hang with me for a minute. I want you to picture an iceberg, you know? And you all learned this right in, early, uh, in your early science classes. An iceberg, most of the mass of the iceberg is underneath the water line. And on the top of the water line, uh, I want you to envision the first two aspects of culture. The first one is what you see, right? So when you walk into a company, for example, um, you can tell right away something unique about their culture. For example, in my early days of banking, that's starting to change a little bit, but it's still largely true in banking that we, you know, the more important you are, the bigger office you have, people tend to wear suits. We have very specific ways in which we make decisions. We have certain recognition programs. We manage risk in certain ways. You can see things. Uh, you can see aspects of culture. It's the behavior and the visible aspects of culture. Also above the waterline, when you think about this iceberg of culture, according to Shine, is what you say about yourself, right? Your values, your mission statement, your beliefs. That's all a part of culture. And yet we all have, you know, examples of companies or organizations that have stated values and then they don't live by them. Enron was the classic example, the great failed company that had an, among its uh, values, integrity, um, you know, and uh, honesty. <laughs> Well, they certainly didn't live up to that. Uh, so there has to be alignment. But the thing I think is most important for everyone to really think through is that what you say about yourself and your mission, vision, and value statements, what you say about what you want your culture to be, is always aspirational. You know, I've always, we, we are very proud of the first part power culture we have here at First Horizon. We actually brand our culture and we link everything to it. I'll talk about that in a minute. But culture in itself, what you say about yourself is always aspiration. You'll never live up to it completely. In fact, you're always working to improve the quality of the 100,000 conversations by doing these interventions so that you can live up to the things you say you want to be, which is to be, you know, to honor diversity, to be inclusive, uh, to collaborate effectively and care deeply about each other. That's always aspirational, right? So there we've got it. We've got above the waterline, we've got the stuff you see. And then you've got the, uh, the beliefs, what you say about yourself. And then to go back to the earlier stuff, things that I mentioned, below the waterline is what you call basic beliefs and assumptions. Like, what, are the, what do you believe? 
And what I learned over my many years working in organizations, particularly in mergers where you put two companies together, that the real way to manage culture is, culture is to understand what happens at a belief level. Now, let me give you a couple of specific examples. I remember one time I got a call from my CEO right after, not long after, we merged with another company. It was a merger of equals. They were both similar sized companies, and I was named the chief human resources officer. And my CEO called me after a couple months and said, John, I need to see you. I've got a problem. And I got to his office and I said, how can I help? And he said, you know, uh, this, these people that work for the company we, we just merged with have no sense of urgency. Um, and I said, tell me, tell me, CEO, what, what, what you mean? He said, well, yeah, I'm always sending out things for them to get from me, but nobody seems to get it back in time. So I said, let, let me do some research. And I'll get back to you. Well, what I found out is this particular CEO had fall, and I knew him well, had followed another CEO, was very autocratic and very demanding. And he had, he had created a cultural expectation in the company that when the CEO gives you an assignment, you turn it around really quickly. This CEO succeeded him, and he, he thought it was magical every time he said something, either by email or by verbal demand, the stuff turned up pretty quickly. But what, what, what we learned in my investigation was that in the other company, the CEO was different. He, he would make requests, but he, he would trust that his people – would make the decision about what was the right thing for them to spend time on it. And if serving a customer or serving a, a, a colleague on something that was more urgent was important, they would make the decision not to turn it around after doing some evaluation about what the request was and how important it was. And this led to a, a different set of beliefs that caused the conflict. Once I went met with my CEO and explained what was going on, he simply changed his procedure. If it was something he needed quickly, he would let them know that but then he adjusted his expectation. Can you see that? Just one small example about how beliefs operate. Uh, I, when I was a young man, I was involved in a merger in two banks in Pennsylvania. And the bank I first worked for was a very conservative organization. And uh, like many conservative organizations, you know, all the meetings were very uh, collaborative and congenial and no one would ever raise their voice if they disagreed. Nobody in fact ever publicly disagreed with a higher up in a meeting. And uh, all the real conversations occurred outside the room. Uh, some of you on the call probably know about situations like that, right? Well, we acquired this company in Philadelphia, and we brought a few of their executives into our meeting, and they behaved very differently. Uh, well, they would challenge leadership. They would fight and argue with each other. And I remember going to Philadelphia where they were headquartered and spent a couple of days with them, and I saw their meetings. They were raucous affairs. And I, I, I first thought as a young man, well, these people are crazy, right? And then I would go out socialize with them in the evening, and we would talk, and they would all say, you know, you guys from Pittsburgh are all crazy. Like, you don't talk about anything important. You don't engage in debate. You don't argue with each other. How the heck you come up with good decisions? So we thought they were crazy. They thought we were crazy. But if you think about it, when it came to this issue of how you make decisions and how you resolve disagreements, we both had fundamental different beliefs. I could give you a hundred examples on issues like this, how decisions are made, how time is used, you know, the nature of, of human beings, you know, do you, do you need to motivate and incent people behavior or are you more a fundamental believer in intrinsic motivation that, that people will do the right thing in order to achieve a goal or do you an organization that has a lot of rewards, uh, and kind of carrots and sticks. So I'll make a point here. When you think about that definition of culture, what's really important is that you step back and understand the beliefs that operate on you when, you, when you're thinking about culture. And as Shine says in his opening remarks, right? A lot of times we never have, no one ever challenges us on our beliefs um, and therefore we don't ever question them. And uh, that's why I love mergers because uh, I'm involved in one right now, and it's been a, it's been really fascinating and fun to bring two groups together. And boy, our merger is going fabulously well. But to just see the differences in beliefs and how it impacts the way people come together. So said simply, as I sum up this segment before I get into a, a kind of transition a little bit, is you know what happens in culture is a group comes together usually by a visionary leader, whether it's a pastor of a church, a director who wants to start a nonprofit or a CEO or an entrepreneur, the group, the group sort of solves that question of external adaptation. You know, who are we? Internal 
integration adaptation. How do we how do we do this? And they they try a bunch of stuff. They try it. It works. Their beliefs work. And they pick people that are like them that believe in their beliefs that they believe in, right? They try it again and it works and it keeps working and it gets repeated. And after a while, people come into the organization and they observe very quickly, oh my gosh, this is how they do things there. They adapt quickly because deep down human beings have a need to, to be aligned with others. And we, we fall very closely into line with other norms and beliefs. And all of a sudden you've got culture. You've got these norms operating on people, and you actually teach people. This is how we do things. This is the right way to think about how you do things. And I know in my HR leadership over, you know, 35 years, uh, I always run into situations where maybe in our screening process, we hire someone that's countercultural. And uh, my CEO, Brian Jordan, and I and at times have, have actually tried to hire people that had thought systems that were very different than ours in order, because we understood this idea that culture, sometimes you get locked in. You don't have anybody challenging you. And uh, sometimes that is work. That is the people that come in have a certain personality style that allows them to challenge in a gentle way. It makes them effective. But a few times we brought in people that really had different beliefs and operated and uh, and made decisions in very different ways than we did, and it creates a lot of tension in the organization. I'll bet you dozens of you on this phone can think of examples of leaders that you've brought into your organization who had a different set of beliefs and assumptions about how things should be done, and it disrupted your culture. Well, if that ever happens, you know, it may be that you hired the wrong person. Uh, the other alternative is that maybe there's something going on in your culture that you haven't ever tested, the assumptions you're operating on. And part of my work in working with groups is to get at that assumption level. Now, so we've got this thing by culture. I've spent a lot of time talking about kind of what it is and how to think about it. I've talked about that 100,000 conversations. You know, let's get down to the individual level because when you think about it, culture is the sum total of, of that 5,000 human beings that I talked about in my example. And we got to know about, well, how are people wired? Like, what is the, what is the nature of human behavior? And uh, here I draw on my research, uh, particularly from a book called Social, you know, how our brains are wired to connect by a neuroscientist named Matt Lieberman. Um, he says that people are born with the built-in ability to be influenced by others, to coordinate with them, and to care deeply about the social process that's, that's, that's ongoing, uh, that's going on. And in fact, that's a, very important to know that, you know, people are social by nature. The reason we came to dominate the planet and we do things so many well is because together we create value that would not exist if we operated independently. You know, in uh, social science, there's a term called social capital. And social capital is this notion that, again, a group of people coming together, the power of their shared knowledge, the power of their collaboration, their power of that, their idea generation would create value that exceeds the, the value of them working individually. Uh, and there's lots of ways to think about social capital, but culture, if you think about it, is that, that you, if you get benefit by people bringing together. You know, I have very serious concerns about culture in this COVID world, as I hear many companies thinking about putting their whole workforce remotely. Uh, that's an area we can touch on in the Q&A because of the fundamental way in which human beings are wired. And let me dig into that a little bit. So. You know, we know from neuroscience and evolutionary psychology is a bunch of insights. And I'll say there's five basic things we know about human beings, right? Very important, because this is how you create a great culture, right? But human beings all have a fundamental need that goes on. To, people have a need to feel important. You know, people, when they join an organization, they want to feel important. And they want to feel that they make an impact on whatever it is, whether it's a nonprofit, you know, whether it's a business, a church, or whatever. I, I'm joining in large part in order to earn a salary to feed my family and to achieve and do the things I want to do. Uh, but people have choices in this world and they don't want to just come in and go through the rotation of a job. They want to, they want to feel like they're important and that they're doing meaningful work. The second thing is, is people need a certain certainty in their life, right? They want a little stability. They want to have some predictability. You know, we're wired as human beings to very pay attention to variability and differences. Um, and, we need some stability. One of the biggest, uh, hardest things about change management as one who's changed organizations 
is that fundamental need is when you disrupt things, it causes stress on people, right? And uh, uh, said another way, when people are uncertain, it creates, it creates a minor threat state or a major threat state, uh, which we have to pay attention to. Uh, the third thing is people have the need for autonomy. You know, I, I used to, do, in all my interviews, I'd ask people, in my dozens and dozens of years of recruiting people, I'd ask people the same question. What kind of boss do you want to work for? You know, you wouldn't be surprised to say they almost all gave me the same answer, right? How would you answer that question? What kind of boss do you want to work for? And they all said the same thing. You know, I want one that gives me some freedom to make my own decisions, to control my own workforce. And in fact, I know, I will tell you this, as a person uh, who's watched leaders succeed and fail over 35 years, uh, a lot of the failures are people who don't have the comfort to provide high levels of autonomy and freedom for people to do their work. Uh, the fourth, and I'll go through these in a minute again, people want to belong. They want to belong to something, and they want to be around people that care about them, and, that, and they want to feel they're treated fairly. And those are the five fundamental things that human beings need. And if you're thinking about creating culture and making it a place where you attract talent to create the social capital I talked about, you have to pay attention to those five things. The fact that people need to feel like they're making an impact, that they feel important, that they have some certainty. You can't have an organization that's always being disrupted. You have to be obviously build an organization that's resilient to change. But if you're always pulling the rug out on people, if you have a boss that's highly volatile and comes in and screams and disrupts things, Nobody wants to work in an environment. That's pretty obvious. But people have a need for impact and importance, for stability, for autonomy, to feel like they belong, that the people that surround them, they care about them, and that you're treated fairly. And if you think about it, your, your job as a leader in creating culture is pay attention to that. Uh, one of the things that I have always paid attention to, to me, is, is, is to pay attention to those five things. And the way you do that is create what uh, Amy Edmondson, a Harvard psychologist, who wrote a wonderful book on psychological safety. She actually created this term psychological safety. Uh, the fact that we all have these fundamental needs, but we need to work in a place that's safe, that meets all those five needs. And I'll, and I'll quote here from Amy. We have a place in our brain that's always worried about what people think of us, especially higher up. As far as our brain is concerned, if our social system rejects us, we could die. Given that our sense of danger is so natural and automatic, organizations have to do some pretty special things to overcome that natural trigger. So said another way, this social brain that we have acquired, this deep need to be with others, to care about others, and to collaborate with them, is the reason why Homo sapiens came to dominate the planet, right? Through, through the theory of natural selection, we, our brains were designed to do what it does now, which is to work highly effective in organizations. And that construct we create around them is this thing called culture. You wanna have a good culture, you pay attention to those five things and you pay attention to creating a psychologically safe place. Because if you think about it, I'll draw on the question, this comes from Daniel Coy's book, The Culture Code. Uh, at a non-conscious level, and maybe sometimes at a conscious level, People that work for you, that are part of your organization, are always asking, you know, three really important questions. Are we safe here? What's our future with these people? And are there dangers lurking? Think about that. Mostly at a subconscious level. And we come into the office every day. We want to really know. And we minimize this, right? Uh, do people feel safe? Can they speak up? If they have an idea, can they offer it? You know, do they have a future? Does somebody care about them? Does somebody care about their family? Um, and to the point that people need certainty, are things gonna come out of left field, as the old saying goes, and surprise us? Because through natural selection, we kind of, our brain has kind of a negative bias. Negative things impact us more powerfully, and we remember negative things. Um, more because of the negative uh, bias of our brain. And so we have these questions that are always operating on us largely at a subconscious level. And as a leader, the thing I've tried to work on is constantly reminding people that the old notion of leadership is that you're about having the best, you know, that you're the smartest guy or woman in the room and you have the best ideas and you can delegate. And 
Heck no. I, I threw that all out the window. I realized that my main job as a leader is to create culture. And it's to do a couple of things. It's to create a safe place for people and to make sure I'm paying attention, paying attention to those five things, that people feel important, that have a certain uh, predictability to their life, that they feel autonomy, that they're treated fairly, and they're surrounded by people they care about. And that means as, as a boss, when I see some two employees standing together in the hallway chatting is my first assumption that those two employees are goofing off, or is my assumption they're building relationships? Because we know from research that people that have a strong relationship with a colleague are five times more likely to seek help or collaborate with somebody they have a relationship with. You know, in fact, it's that whole idea of human beings are built with a social brain that has a need to connect. And if we don't meet those five needs, that moves us into a threat state. So, you know, we, uh, we know about the sympathetic uh, and the parasympathetic nervous system, right? The threat, the kind of flight, fight syndrome, the threat reward state. Well, what we know is that if you don't meet those five needs, you move people into slightly or significant threat states. And when people are in a threat state, well, that's not a good thing because the research is pretty powerful here. People don't solve problems. They don't process data quickly. They don't collaborate, and they're less creative when they're in a threat state. So if you're not meeting those five needs, well, you're going to have an employee population that's in a threat state, and your 100,000 conversations are going to be more emotionally negative than positively negative. You know, there's a, there's a ratio called the Lasada ratio, and some researchers had, were, were kind of studying collaboration among humans, and they calculated that there's a ratio that would predict the success of an organization. Now, the theory was somewhat of a math theory and it's been somewhat debunked, but there's this whole idea uh, that shows up in this book called The Power of Bad, which is about the negative bias in our brain. And it, it says that for every negative emotion, we have to counter with at least four or five positive emotions. Um, but imagine that, you know, if you're not managing an organization where there's four to five times more positive notes, emotions that people are experiencing negative, then you're going to have a non-productive organization. It's just science now. We know a lot more about the makeup of human beings through nature, uh, through uh, neuroscience, and uh, research is pretty powerful. And the job of leaders is to create culture that meets those needs that I just talked about. Here, I'll go back to Matt Lieberman, the, the, the neuroscientist I mentioned later. He said, how should leaders feel about the social well-being of their team members? Does feeling socially connected uh, make people socialize more or less, or does it make team members work harder because they form, feel more responsibility for the team's success? Neuroscience research indicates that ignoring social well-being is likely to harm team performance and even individual health. If What we know from research among soldiers, highly effective soldiers that win battles, when you get down to the individual level and say, why, why did you engage in that courageous act? all these medal winners, well, sometimes they say, because I believe in my country's values, I believe in patriotism, but more often than not, they say this, because I was care, I care for my buddies. I was, I was taking care of, I was, I was aligned with my colleagues. We're in this together. It was their social needs. Patriotism is important. It was their social needs. So as I start to wrap up, so we can go into the question and answer. Uh, culture is a very powerful concept. And the first thing as a leader is to understand that your, your job is to manage the quality of those 100 times of conversation. And you do that in many ways. We have a concept here at First Horizon we call shadow of the leader. So starting with you at the top, you cast a shadow. Oh, by the way, your shadow is more powerful than anybody else's if you're at the top. And if you're a senior leader, what you do, how you behave, is the biggest influence. Your belief systems are also very powerful, but you're the shadow of the leader. You're the key to creating the tone and tenure. But in ways you don't know, people are creating culture on belief systems that sometimes you're not even aware of. You know, neurophysiologists have studied uh, people working together, and they found some interesting neuroscience has really been given some insights again on human behavior. You know, the human mind processes 11 million bits of information per second. 
you know, our brain is made up of neurons, right? There's a, I think they think about a hundred billion neurons and you know, neurons are kind of like, I want you to think about a tree turned upside down with all these connections, trillions of connections, and they're firing all the time, right? And uh, we're processing these things through eye contact, profuse eye contact in a meeting, through listening, through physical, you know, mannerisms. You know, we know through research that most communication is occurring in a nonverbal way. Everybody gets that right away, right? But the conscious brain, you know, it's processing 11 million bits of information per second. We're only aware of 40 to 50 of them. A lot of this is happening at a subconscious level. Um, I know the difference between being on a Zoom call and being in a room with people where I see their laughter, I see their energy, I see their emotion, I see their mood, I see when they're concerned. I can read their body language. I can read their eye contact. I believe that in order to have culture, you've got to have people together in a physical way, not maybe as much as we used to. There's a new world emerging. But to sum it all up, we need to understand human beings and how they're wired. And we need to understand that this notion of culture is not this ubiquitous, you know, concept that we can't manage. But there's some very specific ways that we can manage our culture that will result in having a more powerful and more successful organization. So with that, let me ask my colleague Austin Baker to join us and uh, he may have some questions and he may provoke questions from all of you. Hey everybody, uh, I'm Austin Baker with HRO Partners. A great presentation, John, it reminds me of a lot of our conversations over the years, especially Shine's model, um, as well as, you know, uh, some of the, really the neurological aspects I think are really compelling uh, when it came about really how we're wired at our deepest levels, you know, and I think that um, I appreciate your comments there. You know, I think that we're, at, we're also at a time of extreme change and we all process change in a variety of ways, you know, through fairly predictable, you know, ways as human beings as well, um, predictable and unpredictable, depending on where you are in the cycle, right? You know, right. I'm curious, you know, with, you know, with the notion of, you know, just from the leadership standpoint around culture, you know, a, a lot of culture, like you said, is some some is there in, in the workplace is is, is above the line, is, is visible, and some is, is less yeah. visible. You know, with the melding of the two now, with the the notion of kind of workplace being redefined and a workplace being redefined, you know, what are your thoughts about how you know families, you know, are, are changing that that dynamic as well as we're working from home and working around uh, different aspects as well. There's a there's kind of a humanization of our workforce. What are your thoughts around, you know, what that's doing, you know, from a positive standpoint and from other areas where people are challenged to balance the two? You know, I've always thought that leaders kind of should be the same at home as they are at work, if you're really authentic, no doubt. But either way, you know, what are your thoughts about the, you know, just the, the nature of our virtual place that we're in today? Yeah, that's a great question. It's one I think I think a lot about now, given the challenge we have before. I think we're in this this, this amazingly forced experiment about, uh, we knew that remote, we've been always been supportive of more remote work here at First Arise, and we have a number of people that unplug and plug it at home on a Friday or part of the time, so we've always believed in that. But um, I think uh, I think going too far is going to be uh, uh, very concerning, and, and I'm actually developing a couple of specific models on how to think about that. But I, I'll go back to the core question. You know, there's a, in, in academic research about what is the, you know, there's a lot of research that shows what is a really effective leader. Like, what's the differentiator between an average leader and a highly effective leader? And they categorize that under LMX or leader member exchange. And one of the main components is that, is that people respond to a leader, you know, because of their brilliance and their charisma. We always think of charisma was important, you know, and a good speaker and all that. And we, we find that's less important now. It's really, do you care about people? And with that, the point you made is, you, you know, do you care about their family? Like, People bring their family and their lives to work, right? And I grew up in my early days when I was led by kind of the, um, what's called the greatest generation or the, you know, the World War II generation. And they always thought that you have to separate family and work. And they really, uh, they, they had different orientation towards leadership than we've evolved now. But one of the mm -hmm. things that we have to pay attention to is if we're going to have a great culture, we have to balance that delicate spot between privacy and honoring and respecting privacy, but understanding that people bring their whole lives to work. And uh, we have to be comfortable having conversations with them about, um, 
you know, okay, wh- where are you? You know, what kind of support system you have? What's working there? And then make sure we, we create for our key talent. Uh, maybe you end up not having everybody come into the office for five days. Maybe they only come for two or three. But making sure that the team is coming together uh, together uh, uh, more frequently than everybody's dispersed five days a week. And that during that time, you do the intentional work on improving the quality of that conversation while keeping in your back to the point you were getting at. Uh, what do those people bring in into work, paying attention to that? Because it affects their productivity. It affects who they are, the quality of their – if people are walking around in the threat state because they've got all this stuff going on at home, they're not going to be bigger employees. And if we can help them alleviate, that's part of leadership. No, I think that's great. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, that we, we may have assumed before that people weren't bringing their family – matters to work, but they, it was it was kind of in the hidden at that point. And now it's not, and now they're bringing their work to their families and it's not hidden anymore. Yeah. You know, we're seeing, you know, the challenges of a, 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 you know, a parent with a special needs child. We're seeing the challenges of a, of a parent, you know, who's managing, you know, both home and work at the same time more than ever. And so I think that, um, I think that that's going to be an really interesting and evolving part of our culture and conversation because we're getting to see people's why, you know, we're getting to see people's why they're coming to work. Um, yep. in, in a different kind of way. And so, uh, so though, thanks for your answer on that. I think that's a great way to, to think about it. My other questions around values, you know, when it comes to values, I've always thought of them as the decision before the decision. You know, it's the, it's the, the thing that you decide to, to adhere to as a company, as an organization, or as an individual before you make your other decisions, right? It becomes the framework yeah. for those decisions. You know, I think that a lot of people are never going to forget how their companies, you know, treated them during the pandemic and during the, 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 the upheaval. I think that that's not going to ever be something that will remove from people's minds but uh, very easily. You know, with the spotlight now uh, really turning, you know, really more than ever, you know, through our time of change now towards social justice and inclusion, you know, candidates, employees are asking a lot of different questions, more questions than they've ever asked before. During interviews, I get them as well around how to balance those things and, and what are our initiatives there. And uh, it's really helped to, it's shaped me further as a leader. What, what are your thoughts about how that's changing values and companies? Do you see an evolution in a, in a movement now, you know, because we've been working and contending with a number of things for, for, for a long time. Why is it different now? And what, how is it changing the values of companies? Yeah, that that's a great question. It's also another one I've been thinking a lot about, you know, um, some of my HR colleagues have uh, kind of gone overboard on what, what they call generational differences. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that is a, largely a waste of time in, in the sense that, you know, human nature, I talked about the five fundamental needs of human beings, um, you know, the, uh, the, the need to feel important, you know, the need for certainty, the need for autonomy, the need to be with people that care about us, that relationship need and that fairness need. Uh, human nature doesn't evolve in one or two or three generations. Human beings have fundamentally the same drive. They come in slightly different degrees with all of us as individuals. So, so you know, this, this whole idea that, you know, people need more recognition and the young generation got too many ribbons and all that, that's really overblown. There's some validity to it, but it's really overblown. But I'll tell you one place where it is different, though, and that's at the level of values. We know that this generation that's coming in, for example, on any number of values questions, whether you're talking about gay marriage, uh, equality, uh, inclusion, um, income inequality, um, the, the generation coming into the workplace are very different than the baby boomers, significantly different. And the additional element in their values is that they believe you cannot separate that from work. That's why you're seeing an interesting phenomenon. You know, um, we're not seeing at the government level a lot of uh, movement towards uh, being out front on some of these inclusion and diversity issues, it's coming from large corporations because they understand they're bringing a whole people, a, a whole bunch of new people into their organization that really care about this, and they have the freedom of labor market mobility. That if you don't, if you don't help them at least create a culture that at least shows that you care about those values, they won't work for you, and you will lose talented employees. And so. Some people are critical of companies. The whole ESG movement has been critical by some. Well, companies should exist to make money, and that's the only thing they should do. Shareholder return is that matters. And I love the quote from Built the Last where the author said, you know, profits are to the company like oxygen is to the body. 
necessary for the sustenance of life, but not the purpose of life. In other words, you've got to have oxygen to live, and companies got to make a profit and return money to shareholders. They wouldn't exist. But that's that's too binary. It has to be that you care and to the point you're making. You've got a whole population that are coming in, not with their fundamental drivers of human nature being different, but their values are different, and they will not work for companies that don't at least share some of those values around diversity, inclusion, and equity. Yeah, I think that is a great, that's a great way to think about that, you know, and kind of staying on that topic before we, we pivot to some Q&A from the audience, you know, you know, it's, it, as people are, are, you know, the notion of, you know, some of my r richest relationships really are very diverse relationships, and it's because I, I've taken time to get to know people that don't look like me, and I, I've learned so much more, and I, and I really like a room that looks really diverse because I know that I'm going to have a great conversation, I'm going to get outstanding perspective, and I, and I know that it's going to be the type of place that I want to thrive in. You know, with the notion of kind of, you know, trying to bring people together to have those conversations in a company to really to help, you know, continue to break down barriers and drive relationships. What are your thoughts about the balance of proximity and virtual work and and how that's going to drive things in the future? I mean, we, we might be recruiting talent from all over the country that's virtual working. And, you know, what can we do as an organization, you know, with the changing notion of that to, to bake in diversity and inclusion into our virtual workspace? Yeah, there's a couple of different thoughts that are in there. You know, the one I, I, that, that it wasn't specific to your question, but I, I feel I have to address is this. So, you know, I, sure. I think there's a fundamental belief about this idea of diversity creating value, you know. Um, and there's a, there's a tremendous amount of research about that. If you bring a bunch of people into the room, the more diverse that room, the higher quality of the decision making. I mean, there's some questions about uh, about that, but there's some interesting research that supports that notion. Um, it, you know, Francis Galton 100 years ago that, you know, came up with the notion of the wisdom of the crowd, that it's sometimes, the, you know, he, he actually discovered this notion when he asked a bunch of people at a fair to guess the weight of, a, I think, a cow. And uh, the average of the group was better than any of the individuals and actually came very, like, within a pound of it. And it creates this whole notion of wisdom of the crowd. Well, the wisdom of the crowd is enhanced the more diverse the crowd. Um, so that's one point. The diversity, for those of you that are running companies, you want to think about diversity not only from an equity and an inclusion point of view, but from a quality of decision making and quality of collaboration. Now, the second part of that has to do with, uh, you know, we human beings, to the point I made earlier, we have a need to be with others. We, most of what's going on in our brain is happening at a non-conscious level. If you think you can get maximum collaboration, get the best ideas, and solve the best problems with people being on a phone call or a video conference call, you're, you're kidding yourself. That's not how human beings work. A lot of work can be done uh, if you're sharing information, if you're updating people, um, you know, if you're teaching them something, I think that can be done virtual. But if you're getting into the deeper stuff of collaboration and problem solving and creativity, that is going to be enhanced dramatically by people being in the same room. Because the point I made earlier, most of what's going on is happening at a non-conscious level, and we're not even aware of it. No, I think you're right. You know, I think that there's an instinct, and there's a, I mean, there's even a proven exchange of pheromones, other types of things that happen when people are around exactly. each other, and you're, you're, that, that's not happening. That's not happening in the same way. It that's could exactly be, right. could be think it's happening, but we can't. We the receptors aren't there to pick it up. Not for a person that doesn't know how to do great facial expressions, right? So, so let's pivot to the crowd. So I think we had one question submitted by Adrian, my great friend Adrian Johnson Williams. And so thank you for your question. And, and she was asking, you know, for, you talked about the commitment of senior leadership and culture. Can you t can you elaborate on what that looks like at the very top, you know, and you know what the disconnect can be if if it's not there, uh, or and what what it can mean if it is there from the very top of the company down. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right in your question. Uh, um, Yes, it must begin with senior leadership. Um, uh, any cultural change effort that starts from the bottom up, and by the way, I think it happens both ways, and that's how we've tried to do it in the companies I've been a part of. But anyone that starts from the bottom or the middle will ultimately die from lack of oxygen. It's got to start at the top. In fact, Brian Jordan and I, there's a case study out on the Internet of uh, the culture change we helped lead at First Horizon. If you remember, we came in uh, into the company uh, uh, right after the financial crisis, and uh, uh, 
we, we, th- this is a great company. It's been around for 156 years, and we love the culture, which is what attracted to it. But there were a couple of things we needed to change, and um, there's actually a case study out uh, on that. But I think the thing we realized is that we had to get the executive leadership team in a room and get us to challenge the basic beliefs and assumptions we have and then think about new ones. And it, it's got to start there. Um, and, and yet, at the same time, um, you've got to, it, it's not one of these top-down things. Like, one thing I've learned about change management, understanding the human brain, is people do not change based on the fact that leaders told them. People don't change based on rational things. They don't, they don't believe in the argument, right? They believe based on, their beliefs come from them uh, thinking through the situation in an intentional way, and then coming up with an answer on their own that would lead them to then follow you. So the idea of the charismatic leader walking in the room and saying, hey, we need to change, and here's the five reasons why, yay, 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 everybody's going to want to do it is dumb. It's not going to work that way. People have to go through the process of walking through the challenge the company or the organization is facing and then coming to the conclusion on their own that change is necessary. And so the leadership work is not speaking. It's not sending out emails. It's not putting value statements out, it's getting people in a room and helping them walk through the process of why, what, what's happening out there in the world, our customers, our competitors, our funders, and how do we need to change to meet their needs better? And all these little light bulbs, when you get 100 people in a room, all these light bulbs, you can see it going off in their eyeballs if they're together. That's the nature of work, and that's where it's got to start at the top, but it's got to engage the bottom in intentional ways. That's how you change the 100,000 conversations. Well, thanks. I appreciate your answer to that question. You know, we're getting close to time. And so, you know, I think that some of the biggest takeaways I had, John, from, you know, your conversation that really resonated with me were, were definitely, you know, what you ended with is that it has to start with the top. You know, I think as a leader, we have to look at ourselves in the mirror first, um, you know, to see what's going on and see what we can do to change ourselves uh, and then and then work at and look at looking at how we're reflecting on the rest of the culture. You know, to look through the window and look through that window, you know, when things are going well uh, to, to really lift up. You know, the people that are embodying that, you know, and to, and to work to deal with any matters that may be disrupting that, no doubt. And so I think that the other big takeaway is that we're all wired, you know, as human beings. And, and that while we may be virtual, you know, while we may be in other areas, we have to certainly pay attention to the human condition and how we make yes. decisions as organizations, because that's going to happen no matter what. And then the third thing, a big takeaway was that really, you know, that paying attention to the cultural elements emits their, our change. And thinking about our values uh, as an organization is really one of those underlying things that I think we need to make sure that we're really paying attention to and being authentic to. I think that people are not uh, people are more keen now than ever in our culture, from a call out culture, from a cancel culture standpoint. Otherwise, that if there's a, uh, there's a, there are threads of inauthenticity, you know, of your yep. stated values and who you say yep. you are versus who you are, that that is going to be called upon. Um, and it's going to be called upon with all of our microphones that we seem to possess these days as well. And so I think that's awesome. one question up there. Yeah. If I could, if I could just sure. interrupt for one second, because we, as we run out of time, yeah, there's one question that I yeah. see up on the box is really an important one to get to what you were closing there. Uh, how does the threat state work in a given curtain, uh, given the current uncertainty? They, really, really important. Okay. So I, I mentioned sure. earlier this notion that we move from threat to reward state, you know, um, all organisms kind of move to stability, right? So, we have a natural state we're in, and we either move to a reward state or we move to a threat state based on those five things I talked about. The thing for all of us to keep in mind now, because of the note, remember I said people need predictability? The uncertainty caused by COVID has our whole population at a slight threat state, and all of our leaders at North, we're going to have a great culture to the point this person is asking. We've got to realize that our employees are coming into all work already at a slightly threat state, and that if alleviating that threat state. For example, at First Horizon, um, we really tried to focus on how do we help people solve their health, you know, their daycare and uh, other related problems because they're, they're operating sure. in a threat state. They're not going to be effective. It, you might say that's their personal challenge, but it's the company's challenge. But anyway, thank you for letting me uh, answer that question. No, John, that's great. Uh, you're right. I mean, I've, as we speak, literally, I have a teacher upstairs you know, setting up our employer educational pod you know, that we're using to support uh, people and their families, you know, as they're trying to stay productive at work, an important investment, uh, an experiment that we made as well. So I think we've got to pay attention to that. So yeah, I don't want to do over time. So there's been a few other kind of technical questions that come in. I'm going to hand it back over to Nancy if you want to come back on screen to help close this. But so 
uh, number one, um, the, 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 this, this webinar is being recorded. Um, so, you know, hey, think about what your Monday morning meetings looks like and maybe send this out to your team beforehand and say, hey, let's talk about culture this coming Monday or, or whenever your next meeting is. Uh, so I'd love to invite you to think about how to, what you're going to do with this information. Uh, you know, I'm glad that you're tuned in. we got a lot of great people. I looked at the list of people. Uh, but think about what you're going to do about it. What, what, what are you going to do next week uh, to really incorporate some of these ideas and thoughts to make a real conversation happen in your company? And then secondly, um, I think that we want to make sure that you know that there's a series of webinars going on. Uh, the Chamber was so gracious to invite my great friend John, and you did a wonderful job. Virtual applause for you, sir. Uh, and they also invited me to help moderate the questions, uh, and I enjoyed doing that. So thanks for the conversation. But next week on Thursday at the same time, we're going to be doing the same thing with the panel of CEOs, and then we're going to be talking from a C-suite level about culture even more. And so I think that now more than ever, uh, that it's a great time to be reassessing and thinking about culture to really bring a spotlight back into that uh, from a leadership perspective. So, John, your, your comments are timely and setting us up for next week. Uh, to talk Thank to those you. leaders as well. So um, I think that we can probably find some shine models to send out if you want to look them up. S-C-H-E-I-N, I believe, is the spelling. Um, That's great. So he's got some great, he's got some great books on culture. Uh, certainly one of my favorite books, uh, you know, that you introduced me to is around organizational culture that he has. So, uh, so I think that the invite for next webinar is going to be going out. And Nancy, if you want to close this out, we'll get the follow-ups to you. Uh, also, check out Culture Cycle. Uh, I know that that's another one that, that you're a fan of as well, uh, John. So, um, so check that out too. So, Nancy, you want to close this out, and we'll thank you for being on, everybody, and thank you for letting me moderate. A huge thanks to both of you. Clearly, um, your great gift to our community. We are really thrilled with the the lessons you've shared, the inspiration, uh, the action steps. So, thanks to both. Yes, next week this time. Uh, we have five chairman circle companies that are going to be each from their own perspective, their own sector, their own size of company, um, shedding some more light into this topic. So join us to hear from Jerry Martin, CEO of the YMCA, Frank Quinn, head of the CVRE office locally, Bill Seeley, president and CEO of Varsity Spirit, Ron Redwing of Redwing Associates, and Kent Ritchie of Landers Auto. Um, that's all for now. You can find the recording on our website, probably posted uh, as of tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, John.